Thanks very much, and, and thanks to uh, APL and Lanco and the chance to visit my home country. My interest in AFL is a lot less than it used to be because I'm a Fremantle supporter. So uh, this year, if those of you know it, it's a sad scenario. Um, I've got a, a big challenge here to talk about something that's really complex and where there's a lot of activity. I've got very little time to do it, so I'm just going to scoot through and, and uh, give an overview of this big picture of antibiotic resistance in, in relation to pig production particularly and, and hopefully feed into the latest speakers to, um, to uh, I guess, drill down on some of the points. First thing, uh, everyone agrees antibiotics have revolutionised uh, human medicine. We really, like many things in our modern life, take them for granted as something that uh, uh, their, their um, efficacy is declining. So every meeting I go to at the moment, which is a lot in the, in the US, we've got uh, people from infectious disease hospitals saying we can't... Um, give transplants to patients because they've got uncontrolled infections. We've got people that are dying because we can't control. So it is a real crisis in the, in the medical situation. Um, what we hear is that modern medicine and all the wonderful things they do is dependent on antibiotic use. And when people talk about that, it's all sort of like one big wonderful picture. Antibiotics with everything else we do gives good human health results. The other thing we hear people say is that modern agriculture depends on antibiotic use. And when they say that, that's inevitably seen as a failure. That what is wrong with your animal production systems that are depending on antibiotics? So it's really, there's a double standard very much in the way these products have been around. We're applying them hopefully in the best manner as we can. But at the end of the day, we lose the public relations uh, argument because antibiotic use uh, in the human sector will always trump its, uh, uh, excuse the use of that verb, I didn't mean to, um, always trump its use in, uh, in, uh, in agriculture. Uh, there's a whole lot of things we could talk about in the 20 minutes or so I've got. I'm going to just focus a little bit on the discussion about human health impact because it's important and it's still controversial uh, and a little bit uh, uh, and feed into the other talks about surveillance and stewardship that uh, Pat and, uh, um, and Darren will be talking about. So really just talking about what's happening in other parts of the world uh, uh, in, in, in dealing with this. The first thing that I like to sort of wrestle with is when we talk about resistance, it's like a big three-headed monster. What are we really talking about? We know resistance, we use drugs, we get resistance, we die from resistant infections, and it could be all bugs and drugs, but we really need to break it down. So this is my sort of cloud metaphor. We can talk about it as a sort of nebulous thing that we don't define. Uh, I have my lightning model, which means let's just talk about the things that are killing people rather than uh, resistance gene X in bacteria Y. What are the things that are actually giving the, dog the, the doctors the headaches? Because that's what we really want to be able to prevent and, and move forward on. And I have my, my drizzle model, which is uh, in relation to food animals, what are some of the things that are specifically bugs and drugs we know about that may or may not actually have any impact on human health? So we can move forward with that. And the Center of Disease Control, which is the sort of main public health agency in the US, They've done this exercise for us a couple of years ago and gave this big list here, and they're all funny names, and I won't get into them, but they're the things that they're saying in the US, in human medicine, these are the bugs and the resistance genes that are causing the public health impact. So these are the ones that we actually uh, need to be doing things about and need to be worrying about. Uh, so that's a human health. If we push the button here and say, okay, of those, which ones are we know, you know, from a lightning model, we know that these things are linked to food animals and food production, uh, we get left with really these Campbell and Bacter and Salmonella, which you'll, most of you will be familiar with because they're the preeminent foodborne pathogens that are linked to the food supply in generally and food animal production in particular. So we've only got two of that big list uh, that are obviously related and, and I think undeniably related to the food animal uh, reservoirs among others. I can press it again and say this is the drizzle, but there's all these other bugs that people are concerned about in different parts of the world or, or there's some strong evidence or maybe evidence that these things also could be impacted by what's going on in the food animal reservoir. So we've got a long list of things that uh, are potential and, and real concerns uh, that are feeding into this uh, concern about what we're doing in food animal agriculture with antibiotics. Um, so really just drilling down here, you know, 
over time, the main concerns have changed. So if we go back to the 1990s, and I was already involved in this uh, conversation back then, uh, they were concerned about vancomycin-resistant enterococci, multiple drug-resistant salmonella, fluoroquinolone-resistant campylobacter. So things that are still on our list, really. Uh, but in the last 10 years, uh, it's broadened because we've had the recognition that uh, pigs and other livestock can carry around methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. That's one of the premier human-resistant pathogens and it's been found in many countries in livestock, including pigs, and we have, some would say particularly in pigs. Uh, also, uh, other uh, uh, gram-negative bacteria that have been linked to poultry, and most recently we can see, and Gar Garen will come back to this, about carbapenems and colistins uh, resistant uh, bacteria, which uh, really... Those products aren't licensed in the United States. Galistin is still widely used in Europe, uh, but we're not even using them in the food animal sector in the US, but they're still in the public debate because of uh, their concern in human medicine. So the conversation changes over time, uh, and we've got to sort of respond with what we're doing in the industry. Um, most of the time, you're in a public place, all you're hearing about how the world is deteriorating and things are getting worse and you know it's going to be a disaster. When we look at actual data in the US, and this is salmonella, which has for 20 years probably been the top organism that people have been concerned about in terms of impact on public health from food animals. Uh, what we can, I want you to focus on is actually the blue line there. And the blue line is uh, US, this is a US national data of infections in people with uh, salmonella. Uh, back in 1990s, it was 17% were resistant to more than three antibiotics or antibiotic classes. So they're multiple drug resistant, which is a, is a bad thing. If we look at the most recent data, it's 9.8. So in fact, for our premier foodborne pathogen salmonella, resistant levels have gone down quite significantly in the United States, but that doesn't seem to trickle through into the conversation. It's still uh, bleak pictures. The other thing to mention there is all those other mess of lines above that are uh, salmonella isolates from food animal reservoirs or food, and just pointing out that there is actually a much higher level of multiple drug resistance in the food animal sector than what's seen in the human clinical isolates. So that's telling us that uh, for whatever reason, our systems and our practices are supporting a fairly high level of multiple drug resistance. So it's a good news, bad news slide, uh, but certainly one that, uh, that keeps uh, this issue on the agenda. I'm just going to briefly talk about these uh, livestock-associated uh, MRSA or methicillin-resistant Staph aureus because they've really changed the agenda and driven a lot of the regulatory uh, changes uh, in some countries in Europe, particularly in the Netherlands, because they first found it. Until 2004, no one in the medical community thought that animals had anything to do with MRSA. MRSA was a big nightmare that was uh, related to hospital particularly and also, but just human health. All of a sudden, they found... 40% in, uh, in the first study in, Den in the Netherlands, 40% of their pigs were carrying these methicillin resistant. So that was a complete game changer. Uh, and that has the other thing that is very important uh, is that people working with live animals were at high risk of carrying these organisms in their nose. So they were finding commonly 50% or so of farmers that they would sample or veterinarians or, or uh, slaughter plant workers actually were carrying these things in their nostrils. So if you had contact with pigs carrying it, you were very likely exposed and very likely to be carrying it yourself versus the background in most populations at around a percent or so. So if you say 50 times higher exposure if you're working with animals. So that really got people uh, chatting a lot. The other good news part of it was generally there seemed to be very little risk for the people who weren't involved in livestock. So it was sort of a livestock occupational health uh, issue. Uh, the other thing is, did it matter in terms of health? Well, certainly there were uh, now probably uh, several hundred, uh, more than that, human cases of infections and a small number of, seri of serious ones. So there's been about 10 people uh, that have been deaths that have been uh, uh, linked to these organisms that are probably of livestock origin. Uh, the interesting thing is almost none of them, or I think none of them, have actually been in with people working with animals. So for healthy people working with livestock, you're very likely to be in contact with these beer. If the farm is positive, you're likely to be positive, but the actual health implications to date after 10 years seem to be very, very low. So it's a very complicated story. This is a uh, paper that came out last year, which is the best paper we have in terms of letting us understand how important this pig reservoir of uh, ST398 MRSA might be. And 
It's also important because this is their conclusions. Their conclusions were that these organisms have become a major cause of human disease. Just read that, that's a big statement. And a serious public health challenge in countries with intensive livestock production. That's a very strong political message that uh, hasn't been lost on people who don't like livestock industries. Also, it suggests substantial dissemination of MRSA from livestock or livestock workers into the Danish community. The third thing that's very important for a community communication, for all industry communication, is it strongly showed that there wasn't foodborne component, essentially because they weren't getting any cases in Copenhagen where most of their population live, and if it was foodborne, they'd be expecting to be finding there. So it looks like there's no foodborne risk, but there is a risk that's trickling out of the livestock sector into the general public. So it's a very alarming uh, report. What I you know, dig into it because I don't actually agree with their conclusions. I think their conclusions are we have a non-zero risk. It's a real risk for people involved in, the, in, in those areas, but the magnitude of it is actually quite small. So this is their own data, uh, and they're looking at if people lived in, in, in areas where there was a lot of pig farms and pigs, uh, their risk of getting any type of MRSA was 10.9 per 100,000 years. It's just the number to just focus on the collars. If you looked at people who had no pig contact in that area, about there was the number was 0.7 for the pig variant. So they were saying there was a small number of those people who were getting pig-related or livestock-related MRSA uh, from living in pig-dense areas. They then compared that to the areas where there weren't many pigs. The first thing to see is in those other areas, the overall risk was higher. So if you focus on those red numbers, if you're in a hog dense area, uh, your risk for MRSA was actually lower than it was for being in a hog dense area. But if you had uh, looked at that specific pig variant, you had about half the risk. So overall, there's a real effect. These organisms are getting into the community. They are causing some infections, uh, but the level is low. And we put that in the context of the US where we're yet to have a human infection with these organisms, even though the organisms are there in the industry. Uh, and the average US citizen, based on the public health data, is nine times more likely to die from a MRSA infection than a Danish citizen who lives in a pig dense area is to get any infection, meaning a pimple on the back of the hand or anything like that. So again, it's a real risk. It's a risk we didn't know exist, but in terms of the overall epidemiology of MRSA, it's not, um, I think, anything like uh, a major public health threat. Okay. What I think we know generally, if we use antibiotics in any sector, pigs, people, fruit, anything else, we're gonna create resistance. We're gonna select for resistance. What we do know is the contribution that comes from the livestock sector is greater than zero. And I think to a certain extent, ethically, that's all we have to know. We can argue till we're blue in the face about whether it's little or larger, but the reality is we know it's greater than zero. That means we have ethical responsibilities from public health that we need to exercise good stewardship, which Pat will define for you, which means we're really doing the right thing in the way we're using drugs. The other thing that I try and communicate a lot to producers in the, in the US is that just because people can't show a large impact of harm for what we're doing is not an argument for doing things badly. We have to look after our own shop and make sure that we're using uh, these valuable products in an appropriate, scientifically justified manner. The other thing is that the arguments I often hear is that, uh, well, there's, no, there's 100 countries that don't regulate antibiotic use in, in humans and animals. Uh, and that's where a lot of resistance gets created. Uh, and this, well, why are, we, why are we bothering about what we're doing on our pig farm where in China and Latin America and everywhere else, people are pouring these things with no coal? It's a good argument, but it's not an argument for doing things badly, okay? Just because someone does something worse doesn't give you the license to do it badly, and we need to, to make sure that we're, we're again, uh, f uh, following um, judicious stewardship approaches. Just want to reflect a little bit, you know, the Europeans have led the charge on, on uh, regulation and oversight of antibiotic use, and this has been going on since the 1960s. So I graduated veterinary school in 1975, and it predates my veterinary graduation, this debate of antibiotics in, in use. And those philosophical changes have been driven by all those bugs and drugs that have been discovered and linked back to the animal sector, and it has evolved. 
The first thing that they did, and most will be aware of, you know, uh, was banning growth promoting usage in the EU completely, all countries by 2006. Uh, we're now in the US, we're facing the removal of growth promotants and moving all in feed water uses under veterinary oversight at the end of this year. So the US is about to go through a major regulatory change in availability of antibiotics uh, at the end of this year. The second thing that started about 2000 and now is very topical is uh, uh, measuring of antibiotic use and of antibiotic resistance that Darren will talk about. Um, the issue, uh, basic line is if we don't measure it, we can't manage it. So uh, many countries don't have good data on how much antibiotics are used in the food animal sector. Uh, that has changed in Europe, in, in particularly in Northern Europe uh, and progressively in other countries. In North America now, Canada and the US, we're really looking at how we're gonna go about this challenge of, of measuring uh, antibiotic use. And as Pat will talk about stewardship. So now all these little acronym soup you see there, you can Google any of those and they'll take you to the organ to the organizations or the websites that explaining what are they doing in terms of surveillance and stewardship they're all up there just to show how much activity is going on in Europe in changing the availability and the management of uh, antibiotics in the industry one of the big questions is we know we agree that we've got to go out and measure stuff we can't just uh, be in a, in a vacuum of information about antibiotic use what we're less certain about is what we do with those numbers when we get them. And there's a lot of concern in the industry that this, well, they just want a number to beat you up with and tell you to make it smaller. And there's some uh, justification for that. Um, I think some of the sensible uses for, for, for having information on use are to inform and monitor your stewardship programs that Pat will talk about, benchmarking between farms to understand uh, relative levels of use and antibiotic costs. A lot of that already happens in the US industry under the radar, measuring the impact of programs. So if we're gonna have programs in stewardship, how do we know that they're achieving anything? Uh, and also monitoring, you know, again, effects of, uh, of interventions. What's going on in most countries, a lot of countries have no credible data on antibiotic use. The, way, uh, the first level is just sales at national level. So we know in the, in the US, uh, the pharmacy uh, companies have to report to the government their sales of products for use in food animal sector. So we know that information, it's virtually useless, unfortunately, because um, it doesn't really give us insight into what species they're being used in or anything like that. So you can sort of measure at a crude level. Um, Another approach that's been used in Holland for uh, close to 20 years is just saying, well, let's get samples of farms and look at those farms and, and describe what they're doing to monitor the trends in the industry. So you don't need to know what's going on in every farm, but you, do, you, you get an idea across the industry overall. Is the use going up? Is the use coming down? How's it changing? Um, what has happened most recently, starting in about 2000 uh, in Denmark and more recently in the other northern European countries, is detailed collection of antibiotic use data from every farm and comparisons and identifying both veterinarians and producers that are using higher than expected levels in comparison to their peers and they get targeted for advice and visits from the government about what they've got to change in their operations. So, uh, and this is just a, uh, an indication of a, of a graph. So this is what, how it's done in Denmark, sorry, in the Netherlands here, where they look at all the farms, they measure their use, and this is for sow farms, and they've got a dose measure, me, measurement, which is sort of complicated that they're using, and then they say, okay, if you're in the green zone where most of their farms are, you're a good guy. If you're in the red zone, you're doing something very wrong and we need to come and find out what it is. And if you're in the uh, orange zone, we're keeping an eye on you. So it's just classifying the farms by use to uh, uh, focus attention on farms that are, are using high levels. So that's the structure of the program that uh, is very expensive, uh, very intrusive, um, but it's certainly the, considered the state of the art. So we have a lot of pressure on us in the US at the moment to mount some sort of comparable uh, system. Um, I'll skip over the ESVAC thing. That's just really a, uh, how the Europeans, so Europeans have been working on it for seven years now to try and define exactly how to go about measuring it across the EU and they haven't quite got there yet. So it's, uh, it's easy to say, let's go out and measure antibiotic use in the industry. It's actually an incredibly hard thing to do and requires a lot of infrastructure. So we're being told to do it in the US, but uh, I think a lot of people don't understand the difficulty of it. I'll skip over that one. 
Though we're used to hearing about Denmark as being the, the country you have to watch and follow, uh, on this particular issue, uh, Holland has sort of moved into the first position because the Dutch government, in addition to saying we're going to measure antibiotic use, they said the animal industries have to reduce their use by 50% uh, in, uh, by a certain target date, which was 2015, and a further 20% by 2017. And this is a report on the Dutch success model, saying our industry has done what they were told and without a large amount of cost to industry. So if you look at the red box there, it's saying the total use of antimicrobials in farm animals in the Netherlands decreased 56% uh, in that, uh, that period from 2007 to 2012. So they were able to do it, and they, they, the data say they, it hasn't lost them, cost them much in terms of productivity. So they are the example. The other thing that, and this is data that uh, I got at a seminar at the Dutch Embassy about two months ago. Uh, it's not published yet, but this is looking at, what we're looking at here is data on broilers, slaughter pigs, veal calves, dairy cows, and they're measuring resistance to all sorts of different drugs uh, in E. coli and ericocci that they're getting out of those sectors. The black lines are really where the intervention went in place. So they're saying we've reduced antibiotic use in these live animal species and we've got measurable reductions in resistance genes in the animal. So it is the program is working, we're reducing resistance in the animal sector. Okay, so that's important thing. The next thing that's important is with all this European activity in the last 16 years, we're yet to have a country that's been able to report a measurable reduction in incidence of any human resistant infection related to these animal changes. And this is an incredibly hard thing to measure. So part of the reason may be not that there isn't some benefit, but the size of it hasn't been such that we can measure it with the, with the way we measure disease in the human population. So it's probably, and I believe, we do make a positive contribution, but it's not large, therefore it's hard to measure. Uh, I asked uh, that question of the, of the Dutch people at that meeting and said, well, you're not telling us about the human health impact, and, and their response was, we're expecting in maybe five years we might have something to report. So again, uh, but the philosophically, they're still believing that they're doing the right thing, they're reducing use, they're reducing resistance to the animal sector, and assuming there's a public health benefit there that is uh, of value to society. Okay, so a lot of these regulatory surveillance, stewardship interventions that are going on are still being driven more by an assumed uh, benefit based on logic than the ability to show, yeah, we can change this and actually uh, get a result that improves. And in fact, a lot of their human resistance pathogens have actually gone up over that time. The concerning thing for me, uh, particularly in uh, Denmark and Holland and Belgium, is that these arbitrary targets, where did the 50% come from? Where did the 70% come from? Is that reducing use has become an end in itself and it's not really being linked to, to animal health outcomes, it's not being linked to human health outcomes or even resistance outcomes, it's just we've got to make that number smaller and I think that puts the, uh, the animal producers and the veterinarians in a, in a difficult situation. Um, Three minutes. Okay, I'll just touch on stewardship programs because that's the other thing that is uh, is happening and, and Pat will define it more clearly and talk about it. It's really, to me, happening at several levels. Uh, one is by controlling access, so regulations that affect the availability, the access, the veterinary oversight of drugs in the, um, in the animal industries. The US, up until the end of this year, we've had a lot of antibiotics that anyone can walk in and buy over the counter and use according to the label in food animals. All that is going away uh, and it's coming under veterinary oversight. Um, we'll see later, the idea of cascade, having, having drugs of first, second, third priority and having regulatory restrictions on which drugs you can use uh, first, second or third in animal rated on their importance to medical industry. So these are all regulatory approaches that have a strategy to make it harder to use the most important drugs in the animal sector. Um, 
There's still big questions about veterinary oversight. In Germany, a veterinarian has to have been physically on a farm in the last two weeks to be able to write a prescription. In the United States, we have a, uh, a provision that says the veterinarian has to have adequate knowledge of the, or sufficient knowledge of the health status of the animals to write a prescription. So it's very general, uh, and there's a shift to more and more prescriptive uh, um, requirements for veterinary oversight just for them to be able to prescribe uh, the antibiotics. Uh, and in some countries, uh, the ability of the veterinarian to sell antibiotics has been removed in the Scandinavian countries. So they're saying there's a conflict there if you're prescribing it and selling it, and we want to take that out of the equation. So it's an area where there's a lot of options before we get to the actual stewardship uh, programs that, that Pat will talk about. So I'll stop there, and uh, uh, it was a whirlwind, uh, and um, take any questions. good idea the way I'm talking at the moment. Um, where do you think all this will lead to in the United States, for example? Because the things, some of the things that are coming into the States now are things that we're doing already in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, in your crystal ball, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Um, it's hard to predict the future, as they say. Um, we have a difference, you know, at the moment we have a national uh, plan for combating antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Uh, that has stated plans that are requiring uh, measurement of antibiotic use uh, throughout the food supply chain. Uh, so the, the national plan says we're going to do that, uh, but the Congress hasn't given the government any money to do it. So we have a separation between this is what the plan says and this is where the money says. Uh, where it's going in the, in, the, in the poultry and beef and, and pig industries is those industries are all, poultry are at the front, uh, are all looking at voluntary systems for sharing data on antibiotic use with the government to monitor trends because there is a lot of data already collected, particularly in the integrated part of the industry. Uh, it's politically uh, radioactive uh, and there's credibility issues and all sorts of discussions, but at the moment the uh, the major food animal species are moving gradually towards uh, systems where they can perhaps share data that will f meet the government's surveillance without the government having to uh, take charge and do it their way. So it's, uh, I think we'll, we will have surveillance for antibiotic use in the major food animal species probably within five years. Uh, the scale or the scope of them I think remains to be um, determined. And on the stewardship side, I mean, stewardship's not, not a new thing. Um, I think the hardest thing for our industry is this is going to be a massive transformation at the end of this year in terms, particularly for smaller producers who don't have much, often much veterinary input. So we're already going through a major revolution in, in how these drugs are, uh, are, how farmers are given access to them. And it's sort of trouble before that. It's sort of like you get hit by that wave and then the next wave's coming before you've got your head out of the water. Uh, so that's one of the concerns is the, the speed with which some of these, because they're societally driven, they're not scientifically driven. That was a long way of saying I don't, don't, don't really know, Pat. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um I was going to actually, you just touched on it at the end there, but you didn't talk much about the pressure of the retailers, food yep. supply retailers and their shifts in policies. And they're not really making decisions around, you know, what organisms, what resistance, you know, markers are we detecting and what frequency yeah. rates, but they're making it just on broad brush. How, do you, how much do you think that regulatory environment can be facilitated by retailers advancing that push? Yeah, I, I think the retailers are going to do it their, their way. They are doing it that way. The, the pig industry in the US has formed what they call their blue ribbon panel on antibiotic. And the people sitting at that are from McDonald's, they're from Walmart, they're from the retail sector with a couple of science people. I, I was at a meeting with that group maybe three months ago and one of the, one, shall we say, one of the very large retailers was talking about um, routine use of antibiotics just saying, you guys are going to stop doing that. I don't care how you do it, but you know, no real understanding science, but from their marketing department, they want to be able to tell their customers that they've got things under the control. So there is, there is certainly, uh, it's a pincer movement. You know, there's the pressure through the regulatory arm and there's the pressure through the retail one. And I think the retail one is you know, on a time frame probably going to be uh, uh, bigger. And, but I think the difficult thing there, and, and we've seen that already with, 
different food retailers getting into uh, making marketing announcements about their supply chain before they know their supply chain is there and they have to actually remove products because, well, you know, that's our policy, but we can't actually find a supply. So there's, there's a, a, a need for some uh, education on the, on the retail. And, and I think they understand that now more than they did two years ago.